Good morning, family. At Every Nation Poll, we believe that discipleship is relationship. And that's why we want to invite you to our church services, which here at the church office starts on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. It will be an English service. And in the south, we will have two services, one at 8.30 and one at 10 o'clock, which will be in Afrikaans. We want to just say um, we invite you to those services. Please bring someone along and you need to register for those services. Our youth is also starting on the 21st of February. And um, please go to Church Suite. We need to register for that service as well. And encourage your children to come along. Come and, come and meet up with other people that's got like-minded thinking. We also need some volunteers. The church being on and off and on and off. We need some volunteers to come and help us with kids and with the media and also maybe if you feel that you're a more organizational kind of guy or a lady we need a service coordinator so please come and help us out in that way as well and then um, we just want to just say thank you for each one that's contributing to with to, to the finances of our church um, we have a, i've got a verse this morning in hebrews 13 verse 16 and it says and do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices god is pleased so what are, we, what are we saying? We're saying that we need finances to be able to reach out to people in need in this time. And maybe you don't hear of all the stories and all the testimonies that's coming out, but there's a lot of sharing that's happening from the church office side. So please help us to be able to do that. Help us to be able to share with people that is in need. And, um, and bring your finances, bring your tithes and your offerings to the church office. We have EFT and also on Sunday mornings we will have boxes where you can also leave some money there. Let's pray together as we start off this service. Father, I want to thank you that we can pray for each one that will open up their spiritual ears to listen this morning. We pray that you'll stir hearts. We pray that you'll stir them into motion going forward. We want to thank you that you will bless each one listening in this morning and tuning in and taking time um, to hear what your word is saying. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Got thank you, fans. Pastor James, and for the four people in this auditorium, thank you for that rousing welcome. This is, many of you know what it feels like to be a church planter. Shout out to all of our church planters who start with an empty room. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, though, there's something different about worshiping God in a church building versus in your kitchen or your bedroom or your dining table or in your car with a phone. Even though there are only a few people in this room, there is something different about gathering together. And there's something about the presence of God when we gather together. So I've missed that. Pastor James, thank you for this opportunity. It's really a privilege to stand on this stage and preach God's word. And when I look back at 2020, um, I wanna, just while we were worshiping Pastor James, something the Lord I felt spoke to me out of 2 Corinthians 5, and I wanna commend your leadership in 2020. It was a difficult year to lead, and you did such a, uh, such a stellar job of leading this church to be a witness in this city. And 2 Corinthians 5 speaks about the message of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. And the conclusion is, therefore, we should live as ambassadors. An ambassador is someone who's a citizen of one nation but lives in a different nation. We're ambassadors here on earth. This is not our permanent home. We're passing through. Uh, this is not permanent for any of us. And you led well as a witness and as an ambassador from the kingdom to this city and this state. Thank you for your leadership, Pastor James. And Bethel people, thank you for the way you led and thank you for the way you were a witness to this state, to this city, to your neighborhoods, to the campuses. Well done. Today we want to talk, continue talking about our awesome God. I want to talk specifically about the power and the danger of listening. Think about who you listen to. The voices you allow into your head. 
Do they bring peace and joy and righteousness or do they cause anxiety and fear and anger? The voices you allow to shape your soul. And make no mistake, the voices we allow in our heads shape our souls for better and often for worse. I posted a blog on my website um, a few days ago. My hope was that I would give Christian leaders a perspective on what happened in our nation the past week and even the past months. I would give a perspective, maybe some lenses to look through that were global, that were theological, and that would offer a missiological view of the very difficult state our nation is in. The responses were really interesting. And it was pretty obvious from each response whether they primarily listened to Tucker or Anderson, or QAnon, or some self-appointed internet prophet, (laughs) reading the comments, you could really tell who they listen to. But there's a voice that we need to listen to that shapes our soul differently. And that's what we want to talk about today as we continue this series on Awesome God. The people we're going to read about in Luke chapter 9, these were Jewish young men, disciples of Christ, in a Jewish context uh, a couple of thousand years ago. And the voices that they listened to were called the law and the prophets. And when you read that phrase over and over, Old Testament, New Testament, that comes up, the law and the prophets. And it's basically just a Summarize, it's a way of thinking about the Old Testament. What was their scripture at the time? The law, that was the law of Moses. That was the Torah in Hebrew, or the Pentateuch was the Greek idea of it. Same thing. And it meant the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah, the Pentateuch. That, that's the law. That's who they listened to. That's what shaped their soul and the prophets. And the prophets was basically pretty much the rest of what we would call the Old Testament. And what they listened to, what shaped their values, what shaped their soul, what what informed their mind, what became the filter for all things true and right and wrong, was the law and the prophets. It was sacred. It wasn't Tucker and Sean or Don and Anderson. The law and the prophets. Now, I know there's some who think those guys I mentioned are the law and the prophets, but no. And there are these prophets who have been saying things, and people listen, and then they act on that, even though often these prophets are clearly wrong. So, what does our text tell us? Let's turn to Luke chapter 9. And Luke chapter 9 is a fascinating chapter in Scripture. Uh, Matthew takes a couple of chapters to say everything Luke does in chapter 9. Mark does as well. Usually Mark is the shorter of the synoptic gospels, but this time Luke is shorter. And I chose Luke because he, he, it's more concise in this story, but they all tell the same story. And Luke chapter 9, when we, when we look at the book of Luke, or really, really any one of the gospels, it's a, it's a revealing of who Christ is. And page by page, story by story, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, it's a little more of a revelation of who this baby in the manger really is, that he really is God in human flesh, that he really is the second person of our triune God who has come to earth. He really is God walking among us, but they don't know that yet. But Luke chapter chapter 9 is sort of a crossing of the Rubicon. It's sort of like when Julius Caesar in, what, 50 B.C. or so crossed the Rubicon River, bringing his army 
into Rome. It was a crossing, a point of no return. It was a radical step, and that's what Luke 9 is. It is a crossing of the Rubicon in terms of revealing who Jesus really is. Who is he? His identity. So there are two things going on in this chapter. There are the voices that we allow to shape our souls, but specifically the voices that define who Christ is, who Jesus is. There's no more important topic or question we'll ever wrestle with than who is Jesus. Luke 9, and we're going to read verses 18, 19, and 20, and then sort of walk through the whole chapter. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah and others that one of the prophets of old has risen and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. This is the word of God. Now, the context of this, when we get to chapter nine, the first verse, we see that Jesus has called his disciples, these disciples who their whole framework for truth and reality and history and culture and everything has been what? The law and the prophets. And Jesus calls them and empowers them and sends them out in chapter one. In the next few verses, you see that these disciples now are healing the sick, casting out devils, doing miracles. By the time we get to verse nine, word of these miracles has gotten to Herod. And Herod asked the question in chapter nine, verse nine, he says, who is this who does such things? Who is this? The answer we see in the next little story that's told, which is Jesus healing the sick and feeding the hungry. Begins in verse 10. He's feeding, the, he's feeding these 5,000 hungry people with this time with five loaves and two fish. And he's healing the sick as it goes. And, and, and to, the, 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 the picture, the story, the, the news things happening are answering Herod's question of who is this, but... We get to verse 18, our text. And it's a fascinating phrase it starts with. It says, Jesus was praying alone and the disciples were with him. I thought he was alone. I have been pondering that verse 18 for weeks. I don't want to be one of those people who's in close proximity to Jesus but not doing what he's doing. He was praying, and he was praying alone, but they were with him. They were with him, but they were half asleep, as we find out later. They weren't dialed in. They weren't really present. They weren't really, they were sort of hanging around him, but not fully engaged in the kingdom work he was doing. Don't be that guy. Jesus was praying alone, even though they were with him. I don't want to just be in close proximity to Jesus. I want to be doing what he's doing. I know you do too. And then he asked them, what do the crowds say about me? Who do the crowds say that I am? The crowds have an opinion and then they answer. And it's really fascinating how they answer this. What do the crowds say? Who do they think I am? We're back to the identity. Who is this person? And so the answer was, they answered. All the disciples start throwing out answers. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, or one of the other prophets. Matthew adds specifically Jeremiah. The people listed that the crowd say, they looked at Jesus. It's interesting, the answer is the opposite of what sometimes traditionally we think. The answer was not this meek and mild, lamb around the neck, quiet, um, timid, nice person. That's not John the Baptist. He was blunt and bold. That's not Elijah. He was this miracle worker who confronted evil and injustice and idolatry and immorality. The crowd's perception of Jesus was so different than what we think it would be. 
But that's really not the answer of who he really is. Who does the crowd say? Well, here's what the crowd says. Who do you say? Look, look, look. When he said, who does the crowd say, it says the disciples answered. They all got into that conversation. Now he goes, hey, but, but who do you say? And they all went silent. They didn't have an answer. And then Peter spoke up. It's a lot easier to talk in third person about Jesus than personal experience. The crowd has an opinion, but the crowd is often and usually wrong about Jesus. Individuals have opinions, and they are often and usually wrong about Jesus. Now, it happens that Peter was correct, even though he, his interpretation of his own answer, his answer was technically right, but we'll see that he didn't really understand even what his answer was. So the crowds have an opinion, individuals have an opinion, and what Peter said was, you are the Christ of God. The word Christ, it's the same word as Messiah. Again, we've got that Hebrew and Greek thing going. Um, um, Messiah was the Hebrew idea. The Greek word that's used here is Christ. It's the same thing, Christ, Messiah. You're the Christ, you're the Messiah. We're talking about a young Jewish man here who again has grown up with the voice in his ear shaping his soul, shaping the way he saw the future, the past, and the present was shaped by the law and the prophets. And the law and the prophets predicted a Messiah would come, a Christ would come. And Jesus says, who do the crowds think I am? They think you're a prophet, they think you're a teacher, they think you're someone that's confronting evil. That's all true, but it's not complete. Who do you say that I am? And they all went silent, oh, I don't wanna answer this, I don't wanna be wrong. Peter speaks up, you're the Christ. Bingo, correct, but your interpretation of that is wrong. The Christ was an anointed king they all expected one day, but most of them interpreted that nationalistically, not globally. They thought he would be the Christ for the Jews who would restore the kingdom back to its glory from the days of David and Solomon. So they interpreted it nationalistically. They interpreted it ethnically as Jews. They had no thought that he would be the Messiah or the Christ for non-Jews. It was their nation and their ethnicity. They interpreted it politically. He would be the one who would fix the political mess they were in because of the politics coming out of Rome and something would be restored nationalistically, ethnically, politically, and probably there would be a militaristic aspect to this. Does this sound familiar? Ethnic-based, nationalism-based religion is off. Was then and it is now. Who do the crowd, what does the crowd say about me? Ah, they think you're a prophet. Who do you say? You're the Christ. But they misunderstood what the Messiah was. They misunderstood. They had it shrunk down to just them. And Jesus straightens them out. In verse 23 and 24, he stuns them at this moment. He redefines what Messiah is and their, their minds are blown. Partially because they've misunderstood the law and the prophets. And he uses these phrases, Jesus says to them after this idea of you're the Christ, yes, you're right. And then he says the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised. Suffering, rejection, death, that's not messianic things. That's not what the Messiah, does. the Messiah is supposed to get rid of the suffering. Get rid of the rejection. Get rid of the people dying. He's supposed to fix all that. That's what they thought. They got the right answer, but they completely misinterpreted what it meant and how it applied. We're talking about, in theological terms, Christology, the doctrine of Christ. But all doctrine has to connect to our practice of discipleship. Doctrine in theology is not something that just 
parks and our brain are in a thick book that's hard to read. It has to impact how we do discipleship, and that means following Jesus and how we relate to our culture, lost people, and how we relate to one another. If it doesn't, it's not real doctrine. And so what Jesus does, he clarifies it by talking about suffering and rejection and death and resurrection. And then he says in verse 23, and he said to them, anyone who would come after me, okay, you think I'm the Christ? If you want to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow. Whoa, wait a minute. Now we see doctrine directly connected to daily discipleship. It's not enough just to believe right and have the right answer. Does it lead to self-denial? We live in a world that's all about self-promotion. And boy, we see it in Christian leadership worse than anywhere else, honestly. The self-promotion, the self-absorption, my wife showed me a disturbing hashtag put out by some Christian authors. And the hashtag, and it was explained as after 2020, here's what we're going to do in 2021. Hashtag, I choose me. I choose me? No, 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 no. You deny you. If we really know who Christ is, not just answering with the right word, but the full impact of what Christ and Messiah means, then the logical walking out of that is to deny self, not choose me. Self-denial, cross-carrying. When it said carry your cross, what he meant was that top beam of the cross. And if you ever saw, if we could go back in time and we're there in the Roman Empire, it wasn't unique to just Jesus, but anywhere in the Roman Empire and you saw someone carrying a cross beam, what it meant was they were going to be crucified, they were going to their death. And you carry that thing until you die. It's not carry it for a little while and drop it and then go choose me. No, 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 no. Someone carrying that cross beam carried it until death do us part. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow. Now, this whole chapter is about this radical revealing of who Jesus really is. And it's also about who do we listen to. These young Jewish believers, their whole lives, for generation, their families, generation after generation after generation, their minds, their souls, their view of the world, everything had been shaped by the law and the prophets. And now, this fulfillment of this Messiah we've heard about. He's standing right in front of us, but they didn't totally understand what that meant. And then we see this, boy, this Rubicon moment in this transfiguration story. All three synoptic gospels follow Peter's confession of who Christ Jesus is, the Christ, the Messiah, with this story of the transfiguration. Uh, it, it's about a week later, and it's Peter, James, and John are invited with Jesus up to an unnamed mountain. We don't know which mountain this is, but here they are, they're on a mountain. And Jesus is praying, and once again, he's praying alone, but they're with him. They're more sleepy, and his clothes start glowing. This glory of God shines on Jesus and through Jesus. And then suddenly, it's not just Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Two other people show up, Moses and Elijah. Now, Peter, James, and John are startled by this. 
These are their heroes from their past. These are like legends. You ever been around a legend in your field? You ever been around somebody that you were just awesome, just dumbstruck, just gobsmacked, just you didn't know what to do or say, and suddenly all sense of dignity left you? Maybe you're really into, uh, you know, people come to Nashville and bump into some music celebrity. I probably do, but I wouldn't know who they were. Or maybe a movie star. Again, I, I, I wouldn't be impressed because it would probably go right past me who they are. But there was one time when I was around a legend, someone that I just, uh, I just lost all dignity and ability to relate because this person was an icon to me, a legend. I was preaching at a conference in Australia a few years ago and the other speaker was Reinhard Bonnke. When I found out we were the speakers, I, I told the person hosting the conference, would you please just give my slots to him? <laughs> I would much rather listen to him than me and I think everybody at the conference would rather listen to him than me. And I was so intimidated. I was just, I was just, I don't usually get like that. And I'm just, Mr. Bonke, but he was so gracious. He was so kind. He was so, um, it was amazing. You ever been like that? Maybe around an athlete, celebrity, I don't know. I don't know what impresses you. Moses and Elijah show up. And Peter goes, hey, let's build some tents and camp out here. This is a good place to be. But there were demoniacs waiting down the hill. We'll see later. Not in this sermon, in a different one. So they weren't going to stay there. At some point you have to get out of that cloud, but it's a different story. And then this voice comes. It's Jesus, Peter, James, John, Moses, and Elijah. And this voice comes. And the voice says, this is my son. Remember this chapter is all about the identity of Jesus. Herod asked in verse 9, who is this doing these miracles? Jesus looked at his disciples and said, who do the crowds say that I am? They were wrong. Who do you say that I am? Only one answered, you're the Christ. That's right, but let me explain what that really means because I know you don't understand what you're saying. You're saying the right words, but you don't really get the depth of it or the implications of it. Who is Jesus? Who is he? Who he is to the crowd is irrelevant. Who he is to an individual is irrelevant, even though Peter was right, it still doesn't matter because it's not my truth and your truth. There's only the truth. What matters is not what the crowd says in terms of who is Jesus. What matters is not even what you think who he is. What matters is who the Father says he is. The voice comes from heaven. This is my son. But it doesn't stop there. What he says next is hard to grasp the impact of this next line. Remember, Peter, James, and John, Jewish people, their whole life has been shaped by the law and the prophets. Everything they believe is shaped by the law and the prophets. Everything they've ever known to be true was because of the law and the prophets. What they believe about their past, their present, their future is because of the law and the prophets. And guess who's standing right there? Moses, the law. Elijah, the prophet. What they've always listened to, the law and the prophet, Maybe for some of us today, that's Tucker and Anderson. That's who shapes how we think about today and tomorrow. That's who brings our emotions up and down. Those are the voices that shape our souls. Those are the voices that we wake up listening to and go to bed listening to. He's standing here with the law and the prophet right there, and the voice from heaven says, this is my son. What does it say next? Listen to him. Wait a minute. 
We've always listened to these voices. Listen to him. I cannot exaggerate if I tried how radical that statement was with Moses and Elijah standing there. Now, Jesus did make it clear in the Sermon on the Mount, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophet, but I came to fulfill it. But who do we listen to? I said, I want to talk about the danger and the power of listening. Listen to him. Let Jesus' voice shape your emotions, not the other voices that we allow to shape our soul and form our mind and and control our emotions. When we listen to him, we become what we mentioned earlier, those ministers of reconciliation with a message of reconciliation. Listen to him. We're starting this year, as we mentioned earlier in this service, like we start every year. There will be every nation people all over the world, tens of thousands of people. Some have already started because they're a day ahead of us with a week of prayer, fasting, and consecration. And you know what we're trying to do this week? Listen to him. Yes. Hear his voice. Allow his voice to inform our minds and shape our emotions. I want to encourage you this week. Let's start this year shutting out the other voices and let's listen to him. Practically, what does that even mean? For me, it means getting up every day before anything else and reading this Bible. I don't know how you do that. I don't know what you do. But I want to challenge you to read this Bible every day and hear his voice. Allow his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Allow that word to inform your mind and shape your soul. Don't let those other voices do that. Typically, every year I start in Genesis and end in Revelation, and in a year you can easily read the whole Bible, 15, 20 minutes a day, five, six chapters a day. Read the Bible. Last year, I didn't do that. I didn't read the whole Bible. What I did was read the book of Romans over and over and over and over and over and over and over. There are a million Bible reading plans out there, but let me encourage you. Find one. Get in the Word. Don't be like those disciples who were with Jesus but not really engaged in what he was doing. Let's not be those ones that hear even in verse 32 that says that, 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 that they were they were sleeping and then the glory came and they kind of woke up. I want to end with this in verse 36. After this voice from heaven says, this is my son, listen to him. Verse 36 says, and then the voice, when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. After that voice came, Moses and Elijah disappeared. And it was just back to Peter, James, John, and Jesus. Let's get our eyes so focused on him that every other voice disappears. Let's get so dialed into what he's doing that we're not just in proximity to him, but we're fully focused on him. As Pastor James comes up, I want you to bow your head right where you are, and I want to close in a word of prayer. Lord, help us. Shut out the voices that pull us away from you and help us tune into the voices that bring us close to you. Lord, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us and to the church. Lord, help us this week as we set aside a week of prayer and fasting and consecration. Help us find you and hear you. Lord, today we pick up our crosses and we want to follow and we want to listen. In Jesus' name, amen.